Good morning everyone, and welcome to a new design video. My name is Pandan, and today we're going to be talking about the Jagan. How to design your early game pre-promote, or just generally strong early game unit. So I wanted to make this video because I think it's a very important question you need to ask yourself when designing your game. How do I want to make my Jagan work? What kind of class should my Jagan be? What should their skills be? How do I make them interesting and worthwhile to use? And it's something that can really impact the overall design and difficulty of your game. And so it's really important that you get this right because usually they're going to be joining pretty early. And so they're going to have a big impact on how the player interacts with your game and how they approach it. So what I wanted to do with this video is really just share some of my thoughts and best practices for how I would consider designing a Jagan unit. And we're going to be going through and talking a little bit about, well, what do we mean when we say a Jagan? I'm not really big on archetypes in general. I think modern Fire Emblem has gotten away from them um, pretty handily, I would say. I think the Jagan's really the only true archetype that persists, that and like the S unit of like the low game unit, the late game unit with low bases and high growths. I feel like the Jagan's the only other one that's been pretty consistent throughout the more modern iterations of Fire Emblem. And it's also probably the most discussed because they are really important units. And so if you ever are talking to someone making a ROM hack or you're embarking on it for the first time, one of the questions that I often hear is, well, how do I design my Jagan? What would X class be like as a Jagan, et cetera, et cetera. So I hope this video will help answer some of those questions. So let's continue on here. So what are we going to learn today? We're going to be able to articulate what a Jagan is and their role in Fire Emblem. I think it's one of those terms that we use that people have a pretty good idea of what it means, but we're going to talk about, at least in my context, and for the purposes of this video, what I mean when I say a Jagan unit. And I know I use the old school spelling. That's just how I learned how to use it. I know it's now spelled with an A, but I think the spelling is better. We're going to talk about picking ideal classes for Jagans and understand why they work. Now, I want to caveat and say that any class can work, but if you're new and you're not so sure and you're worried about what the downstream impact might be, I think there are some classes that are easier to make work than others, especially if you're a novice and you're not really sure what you're doing yet. Now, if you're creative, you can make anything work, but we'll talk a little bit about some of the Jagans that tend to be really good and why they're really strong. And then lastly, we'll be able to compare base stats and growths and think through how to best balance these types of units. I think one consistent complaint that I see is that a lot of, you know, the quote unquote Jagan units are really buff. And sometimes they're a little too buff, like Seth or Titania or Marcus and FE7. They're really strong and dominant and centralizing and there's no real drawback to using them. And so we'll talk a little bit about stats um, and how you might want to go about thinking about how you approach it so that you avoid this type of situation. But we are going to make some assumptions here. Now, I don't want anyone to think that what I say is the gospel and that there's no other way to work around it. This is merely to give you a sense of how to best think about designing a Jagan unit, and especially if you're new. So I'm assuming you as the viewer you're a new ROM hacker or a fan game designer. I'm speaking to you as someone who's just starting to embark on this journey or someone who's considering it and not really sure how to best approach this type of question. That's going to be who this is for. If you've been hacking for years and you're like, well, I know how to do X, Y, and Z. This is too basic. Well, yeah, like you probably don't need this video then. So I'm really targeting those newer folks who are just getting into it who are in the phases where they're thinking through what kind of class should my Jagan be if I even choose to have one. I'm also going to assume that you're sticking close to vanilla design principles and enemy makeup. A lot of this sort of discussion in a vacuum doesn't really have a lot of meaning. Um, and so I'm making the assumption that with this sort of, this, at least in, like when I'm talking about Jagans from this context, it's similar to vanilla. In like a vanilla context would this work? In a context that is, you know, only a step or two removed from vanilla, would this work? This isn't going to be super relevant if you've changed everything or, you know, fundamentally swapped certain mechanics that are 
presumably assumed in a vanilla context. So keep that in mind as well. We're thinking through like in vanilla. And I'm also assuming that your goal is to make a useful Jagan that isn't one, absurdly powerful, and free from any drawbacks to overuse. We're thinking of the Jagan as a crutch character, a character that helps you get through a difficult part of the game and then gradually becomes less useful in combat and potentially more useful in other areas, which we'll talk a little bit more about. But the goal here isn't to make a unit like Seth, who you can, who like front to back is your best unit throughout the whole game, pretty much. Um, we want to try and design a unit that's a little bit more nuanced, a little bit less absurdly powerful, and again, reward the player for. Or I don't want to say reward the player. I should say um, make it so that if you use them too much, you see some negative impact um, elsewhere if you're not careful. So I'm assuming kind of like a casual style of play here too. So let's get into it. So what is a Jagan? The eternal question. We use these types of archetypes. We use these different names to describe things. What is a Jagan? So... My definition of a Jagan, and yours may differ, and that's okay, but for the purposes of this video, we're going to call Jagan an early game pre-promote or a high-level unit, usually joining in the first map. And I also use Jagans to describe any pre-promote that has limited endgame potential. So, like, for example, I've seen, like, some games say, like, oh, like, you know, you have your Jagan that starts in Chapter 1, and then you get, like, your Chapter, chapter 10 Jagan, who's kind of your crutch character through like this middle portion of the game and they have slightly better bases than before and are gonna help you get through that part of the game if you're struggling. I think like Federica and Staff of Ages is a good example of this type of crutch unit that kind of comes in like this early mid game to help you through some of the more challenging chapters. Um, but usually I'm thinking of them as, you know, it's Marcus in the first chapter, right? Um, I consider Jagans, they're characterized by good bases low growths, and they have some sort of utility. Um, this utility can be pretty pronounced or it can be pretty nuanced, but they can do something outside of combat that lets them be useful even once their core combat parameters start to not be as impressive later into the game. I think, again, they're designed to be a crutch during the, dur during the early game. They should be someone who can help you get out of jams, and they're good for setting up kills and all that. So I think... Well-designed Jagans are easy to set up kills with. They make it easier for you to raise some of your weaker units. Um, they don't need as much experience investment, and they generally don't get that much out of killing enemies in the first few maps. And so their purpose is to take hits, gift wrap for other units, and continue to help you get acclimated to the game and provide you with that sort of that crutch. Now, some people might be saying, well, well what about the Oifi? Uh, and the Oifi archetype is a subset of the Jagan archetype. I really hate talking about archetypes, so I'm going to address this. And Oifi is basically, they're the units that are like Jagans, but they stay good throughout the rest of the game. So some might argue that, well, Seth is an Oifi because he's good the whole time versus like another type of Jagan unit who like will fall off. The reality is like, I challenge you to play any game and use the Jagan unit all the way through and chances are you probably can. Um, so in that case, they're all Oifis, but regardless, I'm thinking, when I think of an Oifi, I think of a Jagan. They're Jagans to me. I would say all Oifis are Jagans, but not all Jagans are Oifis. That's, I think, pretty standard wisdom around here, but um, for this purposes, we're just going to be saying they're Jagans. Um, I think if it's an Oifi, they're probably a Jagan, um, which is very silly to say, but it's worth mentioning. And then what about units like Oswin? So... This is like another type of implementation of a Jagan. They're high level, they're unpromoted. They usually have lower growths and experience gain in the early games. So like Oswin joins like the second chapter of Hector hard mode or um, Elliewood hard mode or just an FE7 in general, the second chapter once you're into the main story. And he comes in at level nine. He has better stats than most of the other units. He doesn't get a ton of experience. He's really good at doing a lot of things that Jagans do like big chip damage and taking hits. And to me, these units are functional Jagans with more long-term upside. So while they kind of play a similar role, there's usually less harm in investing in them longer term because their growths are a little bit better. And sometimes you might see these units called mini Jagans. And so 
I'm gonna be like kind of bucketing these types of units as well into the overall discussion today because functionally they're playing a similar role early on in your game. There are units that are helping facilitate the growth and protection of your other units. So how do I pick a class for my Jagan? I think everyone wants to try and do something a little bit different and creative when they're making their ROM hack. Um, and I think it's important to think about class, not in isolation. Think through the context of your cast. What type of units do you have? What type of units do you want the player to use? Who's going to be joining your army? And what are some of the gaps that a Jagan might be able to help with? Um, I think it's really important you don't pick a Jagan in isolation. Maybe you want to build your army around the Jagan that you choose, and that's fine too, right? Like you might say, I really want to do a Paladin Jagan. It's like, okay, what kind of units would complement that nicely, right? So there's two different ways you can look at it. Um, but always think through in the context of your cast. Don't pick an isolation because that might just be, it might lead to worse design decisions down the road. They offer unique skill in battle and have access to a strong weapon. So this, I think, is important. And by unique skill, I mean that they can do things that other units can't. The incremental value of the Jagan in combat is going to be significantly higher than their replacement for the early part of the game. And they're usually going to have access to some type of strong weapon. I think a classic implementation of this is like a paladin with a silver lance that only that paladin can use. And that's going to help them deal big damage that no one else can do until you like grind someone else to A rank and lances or whatever it is. So that kind of thing I think is really important for helping a Jagan stand out. It could be a good way to make them feel stronger without giving them a ton of raw base stats, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. And as far as class goes with that, um, think through like, you know, if they're in X class, they have access to Y weapon. How is that going to be unique or complement the other units that I'm working with? And then they also will have utility outside of core combat to keep them relevant. Like rescue utility, staff utility, um, bow utility can be useful to rescue dropping and things like that. So they're able to do things outside of combat that help them remain useful and worth deploying even after, you know, the sun has set on them being these dominant combat units like they were in the first chapter. So what should I avoid, though, when I'm thinking about, like, classes and setting up my Jagan? Um, I think it's really annoying when you have Jagans with innate class crit and killer weapons in general. You know, I think a lot of players like to use their Jagans to set up kills for other units. And so when you have Jagans that have a lot of crit, um, it can kind of be frustrating because they could be like, Oh, my Jagan's stealing my experience. And so you may want to try and avoid that. I think Road to Ruin did something cool where they gave the Swordmaster Jagan, Ava a sword that couldn't crit so you could do chip damage reliably with her to set up kills which was really nice in the early parts of the game so there are ways around this if you like really want to do some type of jagan like that i think you also want to make sure that other units that perform similar functions aren't completely useless so for example i think one of the reasons why the paladin jagan is so good and why is continues to go back to it is that you can have like an army of lower level cavaliers and a Paladin Jagan, and all the Cavaliers are still useful and able to contribute in some way, versus, say, like, a less traditional Jagan unit that fills more of a niche role naturally. It makes it harder for, like, a lower-level version of that type of unit to excel. So, for example, if I'm making, like, a Sniper Jagan, for example, or actually, here's a good example. Um, in Dream of Five, Gareth has a rank bows and he has access to the great bow it's a two three bow that's really powerful and there aren't a ton of flying enemies in that game but he's so good with the bow that you generally want him to take as many shots with it as possible and then you get a unit this unit crow who is an archer that's much lower level and crow really can't do anything that gareth can't already do for you and crow doesn't offer any other unique utility um, I mean, he can grow and become strong or whatever, but I found that he was a little bit more useless that way than, say, like, Franz is still useful even though Seth is monster, for example, because Cavs are just, like, a good class. So think through um, some of those things as well when you're designing your Jagan. Like, will they make it so that other units that join 
as an unpromoted version or as a weaker version later on still have some value? Can they have some value even if this Jagan exists? And another piece of it is stats and growths that mitigate the downside of overuse. So I alluded to this earlier. We want to avoid situations where the stats and the growths of the Jagan are so good that there's no real downside to overusing them. My view is that if you're going to use your pre-promotes a lot, is that they should help you get through certain parts of the game, but they're going to make other parts of the game less easy because they don't grow as much. And so if your enemies don't scale very well, or if your Jagan has like growths like near par to like your growth units, and they're going to continue to maintain relevancy, or there are so many stat boosters early on that you could pump into the Jagan to keep them going, like pumping yourself full of caffeine to keep you awake. It kind of mitigates the downside of overuse, and then it becomes like, well, why not just feed all my kills to my Jagan? Because they're still going to be great anyway, and they're going to make the best use of that experience in the long term. So why not? And I think that kind of promotes juggernauting. It promotes, I think, less exciting types of play. I like having a broad army with different things that they can each do. And so if I'm being encouraged implicitly by the game's design to funnel everything into one unit, because they're either one really good or two, the enemies are so bad that the Jaga never really falls off. I think that's uh, something you want to avoid. And I also think it's important, and maybe this is a bit more of a con controversial opinion, but I don't think the Jagan should be essential to beat the game even on lower difficulty. I think a Jagan should help make the game easier but you shouldn't make it so that the player like absolutely needs to commit to their Jagan to win the game. Like as a kid, I used to be one of these people who were like, oh my God, pre-promote's bad. Marcus gets four experience every time he kills a brigand. He's making it so that I can't use Elliewood or Bartra or any of these other units. He's bad, I don't want to use him. FE7, thankfully, you can get around this and just not use him and it's fine. But I think some of the games, especially in higher difficulties, it's like absolutely essential. Like Frederick is essential on Awakening Lunatic. He's so important to getting that done. Um, lower difficulties, less so. But something you want to consider as well, like make it so that the Jagan helps you win the game, not be the only way you win the game. Like you should be able to like with enough skill get through it without them. So just keep that in mind. So let's talk about classes. What should I pick? Select your Jagan. Here we have Titania, one of my favorites, but um, how should I pick classes? Let's go through some of the classes that I've shortlisted as a little bit more ideal or easier to implement. If you're new and not so sure, like, you know, what would make for a good Jagan, let's kind of break that down and go step by step. So we talked about this a little bit, the Paladin. It's a classic choice. And there's reasons why they they usually come with multiple weapon ranks, um, sometimes lances and swords, sometimes all three of the weapons in the triangle. They have multiple weapon ranks, which gives them a little bit of extra utility. They can use a bunch of different weapons um, in most cases, again, vanilla context. And so that helps them be pretty useful in combat and make use of other weapons, especially if like another unit died, they can pick up the mantle there. Um, they're characterized by high movement which is really useful and gives them a bit of extra edge over other units as they, as the game progresses. They have good rescue utility as well. So like if your weaker units are getting slammed, they can pick, they most of the time they can pick them up unless they're like a heavy fighter or an armor knight or something. So rescue utility, always really nice because it just helps the player get out of these tough situations, even in a non-combat scenario. And they do have a clear drawback. They have a horse slayer weakness. Uh, which is nice, so like horse slayers, riders, banes, halberds, zimbados, long swords. Sometimes people will do like magic that's effective against beasts or horses. So they have this sort of drawback to them that makes them less than impervious, and if implemented well on the enemy side, it'll actually help keep your Jagans, your paladin Jagans, in check. So something to consider there. This is a really classic bread and butter class, and there's a lot of reasons why. You know, you can give them like an A rank sword or lance or something like that. Um, that none of the other units can use and they'll be in a good position and they don't have any innate crit and so it can be pretty easy to kind of balance them around. They usually have balanced stats and so they're um, a really nice intro class that's easy for a new player to pick up and get familiar with and help ease them into the game. 
I think the Great Knight also is like a nice subset of Paladin, a little bit more of a modern take with Frederick here on the right. They too have multiple weapon ranks. I see a lot of the time they either get the triangle like you see in vanilla. Sometimes people will do like axes and swords or axes and lances. Um, but generally they have multiple weapon ranks so they have a bit of versatility in how they attack. And unlike the Paladin, who's a little bit more balanced usually, they tend to lean in more in strength and defense and lower speed. I think low speed is one popular way to make a Jagan. Like if you were to put Jagans into different buckets, I would say they're either going to be like kind of balanced, they're going to be more like about offense and lower speed, or they're going to be a little bit more about speed and lower offense. That's like some of their drawbacks. So like um, the Great Knight generally, they'll be great at doing chip damage and taking hits, but they'll probably be really slow and maybe even get doubled later in the game, which limits their combat usefulness as things progress. So that's like a power dragon to me. Um, they also offer rescue utility and they also have horse slayer and armor weaknesses. So again, those clear drawbacks, uh, they have some utility outside of combat with rescuing. They can play a couple different roles really well. And again, most importantly, they're doing big chip damage and uh, helping you gift draft kills for those other units. Speaking of big chip damage, another one of my favorites, and actually probably my personal favorite type of Jagan, is the Warrior Jagan. And they're characterized by big chip damage. Like, Warriors are a very strength-oriented class, and Axes are generally really buff, so they can do big chip damage, whittle those guys down to low HP so it's easy to get your noodly Lords killed. And uh, also, they offer bow utility in some cases. And having like a high ranking bow user can be really interesting up front, especially if your game has a lot of threatening flyers, like maybe you like enemy wyverns, and this type of class can be a really nice way for you to deal with those more easily. Um, in the case of Dagdar, there are quite a bit of flyers in Thracia to deal with, but um, I think more importantly, he has capture as well. He's got that big con, which. Provides a little bit of a pro and a con, so it's great. He could use the heavy weapons more easily without as much of a speed loss. But it also makes him harder to rescue and move around the map. So as the maps get bigger, and as the game gets a little bit more difficult and you want to move faster, um, a unit like this might actually slow you down. I know people will complain about units like Dalson for this reason. With his high build, it makes him difficult to rescue. Same can be said for Dagdar to a lesser extent. Um, and so... You might have a harder time moving these units around the map to do damage later on, and so you might decide to think, all right, maybe I want another unit predominantly doing combat. So warriors, big chip damage, offer you some interesting bow utility. Um, but again, be careful with the bows. You don't want them to be so significantly better with bows than your other archers or things like that, because then you don't really have much reason to field them unless you have a lot of flyers and you want to use multiple bow users, or you make bows really good. Make bows good, guys. It makes a big difference. And then, got the General or the Armor Knight. I have Tar Neo here. He's not really like, you know, a Chapter 1 Jagan, but he's kind of plays that role in Part 1 of Radiant Dawn just a little bit. And they're functionally pretty similar to Warriors. They have big chip, pick chip damage. Unlike Warriors, who are a little bit more about all strength all the time, they, they have more defense and lower speed, so they're a bit better at tanking, kind of slowing the play of game down taking on a couple more enemies at once. They're probably more likely to get doubled earlier on as the game progresses, especially if you give them like a decent enough speed base to not get doubled up front, but not really much of a growth so that they start to get doubled later. That's the nice like sweet spot, I think, um, for the arc of a general. Similarly, high con, hard to rescue. So that's a bit of a drawback for them. They also have the armor weakness, which again, if you design your enemies well and put give them stu tough stuff to deal with, it provides another drawback for them too. Magic generally is good against generals if you're giving them low res. So good class like for, for helping gift wrap. Like I think Oswin's a terrific functional Jagan in this regard because he can do big damage. He has usually good weapon ranks. We can use high level lances early on. He sell he helps players he helps players ease into the game. Um and if you're a new player, you're gonna lean on a unit like this a lot. And this is why I think early game armor knights tend to function best when they're a bit higher level and they have better bases because grinding a unit like this that's like low speed and doesn't offer you that immediate defense utility is going to be a little bit more challenging. So like a high level like Jagan general 
um, could be an interesting thing to experiment as well. Especially, you know, I'd say very noob friendly, which um, can be good depending on what you're going for in your game. Getting a little bit more interesting now. We have Rogue Jagans, we have Soth here. Um, I think there are ways you can make a unit like this interesting. Um, one thing is that, you know, early on, like for example, Soth has a lot of great combat utility. He's really one of your better combat units in the early parts of part one. He doubles everything. He can crit a lot. He's good for clearing things out. Um, but even once like the game gets a little bit more difficult, he still offers you some thief utility, which is nice. And in a GBA context, if you're saying like, okay, this guy has lock touch and um, they can see in fog and use torches and things like that, like that's pretty cool. That gives them a reason to be deployed even after they've done their part. And they're usually characterized by lower strength and higher speed. So instead of like a warrior or a general where they might do like one big hit of chunk, chunk of damage, they might do two chunks of smaller damage to get to the same result. Um, and be less likely to double, do a little bit more dodging, things like that. So different sort of take on a Jagan. They're probably going to be a bit frailer. So you'll want to be careful with how much you use them frontline as the game progresses. But um, I think this is a pretty interesting thing to consider. Um, again, as long as you make it so that they're not doubling and one-rounding everything up front. I think that they could be pretty pretty nifty to use. Sorry, I'm just jamming out to this music right now. Uh, Valkyrie. So I wasn't going to put this here, but then I was playing Souls of the Forest. And I was like, you know what? This is actually a pretty interesting take. And not something I've seen really any of the vanilla games do, if I'm not mistaken. But Valkyries and by extension Mage Knights and other really magic units, they all have staff utility, which is really nice. And sometimes that can be a detriment to like the early game Priest or Cleric that you might get. But generally healing... Healing is its own bucket of experience, so um, you might want to use a second healer anyway at some point, even if they're not as good as the Valkyrie, because the Valkyrie can probably do a lot more things. Like, they have mount utility, so rescuing, um, carrying units around, things like that, stuff that other units can't do. They have higher movement, so they can get to different places that maybe your cleric couldn't get to, so the cleric could focus on healing a bit more. So the Valkyrie, in that case, will have staff utility, but it might not always be their best option as it would be for like a cleric. So that's like one way to make a weaker unit or a lower level unit still work, even if they play the same role as this other type of unit, because the Valkyrie can do so many other things. So you have to weigh that cost benefit analysis turn by turn. They also offer you magic damage, which is generally pretty buff. If you balance them well, like maybe for example, like they start off with like an L fire tome and a ton of speed but it weighs them down to hex, so they're only doing like big chips with it safely at range. So that's like an interesting way to go about doing it um, early on. And that also will probably help them stay a little bit more relevant as the game goes on because magic generally is good on offense deep into the game. So even if their magic growth isn't super high or their base magic isn't great, generally enemy res is so low that this will be still pretty useful. And then lastly, they're fast but frail, so kind of like the rogues. Um, they probably won't be able to take too many hits. They probably will double and not get doubled very much, but their bulk is going to be really lacking. So you got to be careful with them um, or else they'll die. So something to consider there. Uh, this one's a little bit more of a meme pick, but it's worth calling out because we have alluded to items quite a bit here. It's the Levin Sword from Gaiden or Shadows of Valentia, depending on your preference. And this is another interesting way to go about creating a quote unquote Jagan is how do I create chip damage without it having like a powerful unit? Gaiden doesn't have like a traditional Jagan unit. You could argue that like Lucas and Alm are good at setting up kills and stuff, but like they stay good throughout the whole game. And Alm's your lord, so you're obviously going to use him. The Levin Sword's interesting because it does big chip damage in the early game. It helps you clear things out, it helps you set up kills. It's Easy to calculate, they're doing 15 damage per hit, and its utility decreases over time as units get better options. Once I get powerful and I'm starting to double more regularly, and I can do more than 15 damage per round, the Levin Sword starts to become a less attractive option. And I think that's a good way to kind of ease players out of using that item, because their other options get better as they get trained. So that's something to consider as well, like if you're thinking, I don't really want to do like a big powerful unit, I'm worried they'll steamroll and become the next Sather Titania. Well, 
you can give the player like a limited use item like this that'll help them get out of these difficult situations up front. And then uh, once it breaks, by that point, they probably can do other things anyway. So item Jagans, again, kind of an interesting approach. Um, could be a little bit more difficult to implement up front if you're not so sure like with the length of your game or the general difficulty, but it's an, idea, it's an idea worth considering. And you can do something kind of similar with um, just giving like a silver to like a pre-promote. This idea of just like a really good weapon that helps out early that like you won't get access to again for a while. So it's going to help you get out of these tough situations early on. But what about all these other classes? So I would say one of those classes I've gone page by page on are probably some of my favorites. Here are some others that I do want to make a quick note of. I would say these are going to be a little bit harder to implement well if you're new and not really sure about what you're doing. And that's not to say these can't work. I've seen them work. I think they're harder to make to make work, personally. So, Swordmasters, Halberdiers, Assassins, Berserkers, these classes that are generally defined by having innate crit, mono weapon use, infantry, I think these classes generally tend to like live and die by their combat. They don't really offer you a ton of utility outside of combat, and so if you're making them a Jagan where they're going to fall off, I feel like they're going to fall off pretty hard. And the crit also makes it harder for them to gift wrap units kills. So can you make it work by giving them stuff like the training sword and road to ruin or what have you? Yeah, of course. Um, but I think these types of units are going to be a little less versatile and harder to use and generally well or better suited for a cla for a character that you're like, I want them to be all combat all the time and maybe like start them lower level and grind them up so that they become more powerful, or like as a late game filler pre-promote. I think these types of classes tend to work a little bit better as, but again, you can make this work. Snipers, I've talked about bows a bit, but with snipers, I find that because they're so niche as is, like they're bow only, they have no enemy phase, I feel like that nuance and that utility can be better served by just like a lower level, weaker archer that you can train versus like one that's like out of the gate and playing this bigger role. Again, can you make this work? Yeah. Like I think I'm playing through Fire Emblem Alethea by Epic here right now. And like the Sniper Jagan, while I definitely have some reservations about the decision, it still works. Um, there are ways you can make it work. You can make the utility very useful, like longer bow range and things like that. Lots of flying enemies for them to deal with. It's certainly a different type of implementation. And so it can be a little bit harder, I think, for a new player or a new designer to balance around um, because they're such like a functionally different type of class than your traditional Jagan. So definitely, I think, a bit more of an advanced option. Uh, but again, you can make anything work. Falconites and Wyvern Lords. Um, I think flying utility is really buff. I haven't really seen many people do flying Jagans before. Um, but I think, like, strong flyers can just be so dominant because they have ignore, ignore terrain. You have to be really conscious in your enemy design if you want to use flying jigs. Like, lots of ballistas or archers and things like that to keep them in check. Um, wyvern slaying weapons and things like that. Like, they're, you're going to need to keep these classes a bit more in check because they have so much freedom. Um, and I think the risk-reward of, like, a weaker flyer that can, like, get one or two hit by an archer is a bit more exciting and fun to work around than like, say like Seth the Falco Knight where they steamroll everything. It's just very, flyers can be very dominant without that much work. So if you're a little, cog if you're not super sure about like balance, this class might be a little harder to work with because I feel like they can become dominant very quickly. And then lastly, there's the hero. And I don't really know why. I just haven't seen like great implementations of hero Jagans. I think probably like, the one idea I had for, like, a good hero Jagan would be, like, Echidna. Like, imagine Echidna if she joined in, like, Chapter 1 instead with her bases. With, like, a steel axe and like that. So she gets weighed down and can't really double very much. Um, so you can you can make stuff like this work. Vlad and uh, Order of the Crimson Arm is kind of interesting. But I think heroes generally, they have good offensive parameters. And so... And they're not usually, like, 
They don't offer you as much utility outside of combat in general. So I find that like the ramp off is a little bit worse. But again, depends on your game. But probably not the class I would recommend. I feel like they're generally more of like a pure combat class based on just like their infantry, swords and axes, not no mount utility, things like that. They're, they're not going to really offer you much outside of combat. Um, so once they start to fall off a little bit, they might fall off really hard. Again, they can totally work, but it might be a little bit harder to make work. And again, any class can work if you balance well enough. You can make a Fleet Lord work, a Fleet Jagan work. You can make a Mogul Jagan work. You can do whatever you want. You just need to be really conscious of how you balance it, what type of enemies you put to counter. Some of these classes that I've listed here, I think the way Vanilla designs their maps, and if you're designing your maps with a similar sort of lens, it's going to be harder to design them to be as balanced as they could be. So that's my take there. So now you might be wondering stats. How do I do stats? It's really important that you don't look at stats in a vacuum. Consider them relative to enemy units and how much damage they're doing, how much damage they're taking, etc. Um, we're going to go through a couple examples, actually, as we see some scenarios. Just so you can visualize what I mean like with starting parties and stats. But um, let's see. Stats. Jagan should have solid bases. That goes with that question. They should be useful out of the gate with no investment. I think a good Jagan has middling to poor growth, so the more experience sink into them, they're not really getting as much out of that experience as, say, like your Lord or some of the other group units in your starting party. They shouldn't be growing at the same rate with better bases, because then there's no reason to use the other units with lower bases and similar growths. They're probably not going to be your best option after the first few chapters, and that could be like after five chapters, after ten chapters. Depends on the curve of your game. And enemy stats, man. Enemy stats are so key. Know how you want to scale the game. Know how you want your enemies to look and feel. And that'll help you determine what stats are going to be appropriate for your Jagan to best dismantle that for a certain period of time. Everything needs to be based around the enemies that they're fighting. Uh, Paladin Jagan is going to be pretty useless if your game is all desert maps with Horse Slayer Pegasi, right? Um... Consider your game. That's going to help you determine the stats, the class that you pick, the weapons that you give. It all really starts with enemies and the level curve that you decide to give. So think about that too when you're picking out the stats for your jig. And even if you're like, well, 15 strength sounds good. It's like, well, why is 15 strength the right number here? Let's look at how much damage it actually does. So let's talk about scenarios. What does this look like in practice? So we're going to go through... I'm going to lower this music a little bit getting a little loud here this guide music or this echoes music is a little loud um so let's look at some implementations of this so this is fe6 chapter one now here's your starting cast you can see here most of your units are unpromoted they're level one they're pretty weak and then you have marcus front and center marcus comes with the highest stats across the board except in defense which Boars takes the mantle of, but Boars is at Weapon Triangle and gets doubled in hard mode, so he's not really that great. Um, Marcus is going to be good because his bases are better, and against the enemies that you're facing, he's going to be able to take hits and do decent damage back. But he's not so much better that the other units won't catch up to him um, with some investment. So I think this is like a pretty good way to just like think about like stats. Like if you're just looking at it in a broad vacuum, think about this. Marcus is only he only has three more speed than Lance. He's got five more speed than Alan to start. Um, his growths are not very high, so the other ones will probably catch up if you're not super unlucky. His stats are decent enough to carry you through like the first couple of chapters, and at that point, some of the other units will start to catch up and eclipse him. But he's still useful because. He's just like them, but with less upside down the road. And he still has that nice 14 aid and 8 movement and pretty solid HP. So he's going to be doing a lot of different things for you. But you can see just he only has 9 strength. He's not going to dominate. He's not going to immensely dominate, and that's important. He's not going to solo maps for you. He's going to make it easier for these other scrubby units to do their jobs better and help them get to where he is and eclipse him, which I think is the right way to go about it. He comes with a Silver Lance, he has an A rank in lances, which none of the other units have. 
So he has that unique option as well, which helps him do bigger damage, occasionally double and kill big threats. And so he can kind of stretch up or down depending on what you need. So like I love the the classic Silver Lance Iron Sword. Iron Sword for chip damage, Silver Lance for, for getting things out of the way. Um, helps these other scrubbier units um, get some kills and do a little bit more damage and get better over time. Using them as a way to help feed kills to your other units. I think it's pretty interesting. Here's another implementation. I apologize for the sensory overload here. This is Fire Emblem 3, Book 2, Chapter 1. Um, I like, one, I love big starting parties. So this is really fun for me to look at. But over here on the far right, we have Aaron, who is, or I guess he's Alan in this older translations patch that I have. But um, what's interesting about Aaron is pretty similar to Marcus. He doesn't really have that much better stats than everyone else, but they're good enough that it makes a difference. The biggest difference here, though, is this weapon level stat. So FE3 doesn't have weapon ranks like in some of the more modern GBAs. It has this weapon level stat. He has the highest weapon level. He's the only one that can use the Silver Lance again up front. He can dismount and use a Steel Sword too. Uh, he doesn't really have that much extra bulk. He has 10 defense. It's one less than Doga, but um, he's going to be useful for those first few chapters. But after a couple of level ups, if you're using your other calves, um, they'll probably catch up. When I played FV3, I found that Cecil catch caught up to Aaron pretty quickly. And especially once you get serious, just a few chapters later, um, Aaron definitely still useful, but certainly not my best option. But in this first chapter here, he's easily my best option. He's great for setting up kills and things like that, and just kind of drawing in some enemies, enemy attack. Um, good implementation of a Jagan. Maybe less so in FE12 with reclassing and all that. Um, but I really like how Aaron performs here in FE3. And you can see again, Slightly better base stats across the board than your other units. Not significantly better. Um, it's going to take him a little bit longer to grow, so every experience point he gets doesn't go as far as it will for these other units you have here. And he's going to have access to that unique weapon. Let's get into some ROM hacks. So, I know I've just gone through two pretty traditional examples, and you're like, yeah, Dan, Paladins are great, we know this. But what about some less traditional examples here? So this is Faith and Blood by Bloopy. This is just starting party in 1P Embers. And I've put this here because I like Bryce. Bryce is a pretty like non-traditional Jagan unit. He's really much more like an Oswin. He's a knight. He comes at level 5 while the rest of the units come at level 1. And his base stats and strength and defense are notably higher than your other units. Like he beats everyone by at least 5 points on defense and at least 2 points on strength. And so he's going to be really good at... Dishing out damage and taking hits. He's got Fiery Blood as well, which gives him extra damage every time he's hurt. So he's really good at frontlining and dealing big damage. And that's going to be pretty unique compared to some of your other units that you get. He also has Lances and Swords, so he has some versatility in the types of weapons he uses. Kind of similar to like the Silver Ants Iron Sword dichotomy. Brights can do something similar. And it goes to show that you can have a functional Jagan unit without making them like level 12 promoted and like super high base stats. Like Bryce isn't that much better than your other units up front, but he can functionally play that role and make it easier to feed kills to like Eliash, Eliash, Landon, or Mary and some of the other units you get later on. And he's still good enough. Like you can see his growths aren't like significantly lower, but he's still good enough to be useful throughout the game. And if you invest in him heavily... He could be one of your best units longer term, which I'm less crazy about. But I'm saying that, like, it's a good example of, like, someone who starts off with good bases, stays relevant, but probably won't be your best unit longer term. Right? He's got four move, which is a little bit of a limiting factor um, longer into the game as the maps get bigger. So that becomes a bit of a drawback. He's got armor weakness. It's a pretty good implementation of, like, a less traditional Jagan who's starting at, like, a lower level. But Bryce kind of functionally still plays that gift wrap crutch role that we saw with Marcus and Aaron. So another interesting angle to consider if you're looking to do something like that. And then if you're really different, we have Souls of the Forest by Skryza. This is your starting party in chapter one. We have um, kind of similar to FE3, the three different Cavaliers. 
And up in the top left, we have our girl Raquel. And Raquel's a Valkyrie Jagan, and I never really thought highly of, like, a Magic Jagan until I played Souls of the Forest. And again, like, to caveat a lot of this, like, this is a very different Fire Emblem experience than, like, vanilla GBA. Um, so you might be looking at the stats and being like, whoa, those are high. But in this game, it's not really super high. But what's interesting is that Raquel focuses very heavily on speed, so she's doubling. She's able to do big chip damage with, like, a light tome or straight up one round things with a divine tome. Her power isn't great, so she's not going to scale very well. But even like later into the game, like 10, 15 chapters in, she's still like going to be doubling a lot. And she has staff utility and mount utility. So she kind of like eases out of this role of being like your primary offensive powerhouse unit into being like a really good support unit. Um, Cause you can see she's not very bulky. She has five defense and a pretty low growth in it. She's not super powerful. She doesn't have great staff range which is an interesting drawback as well. So while she, at the start, is clearly better than most of your other units, she's going to kind of transform her role. All these other units are going to eclipse her in combat at some point if you invest in them, but she's always going to have staff utility. She's going to have mount utility. She has 16 aid. Pretty, pretty interesting take on a Jagan unit. A little bit different. Again, Raquel's definitely a bit more of like a, a workhorse up front um, and is someone that you can be okay investing in longer term, but that's because of how, but her role will change over time. So different implementation if you're feeling a little bit more risky and want to try something a bit more unique. So pretty cool. And that's all I got for you. Um, I hope this video is helpful. I know I can ramble on for quite a bit about this type of stuff, but let me know if you have any questions. I'm curious to hear your thoughts in the comments. Overall guys, like it's your game, do what you want. But if you're struggling to figure out, like, how do I balance a Jagan or pick the right class? Or how should I consider, you know, both their short-term and long-term uses? I hope this video helped start to give you, start that discussion for you. And again, if you have any thoughts or feelings on this, definitely leave them in the comments. I'm sure I probably missed some things, but we've been going for almost an hour already and my voice is tired. So I enjoy making these. I hope you enjoy watching them. And happy ROM hacking. Good luck making your game. Let me know if you have any questions. Always happy to strategize. And again, everything comes down to how you balance your game. You can make anything work. But if you're just getting started out and you're not really sure and you kind of want to stick close to source material, this might help you think through some of those things. So I hope this is useful to you guys. My name is Pandan, and I'll see you next time for some more. Thanks again, and take care.